Hello, my name is Leith Davis. I'm a professor at Simon Fraser University in the Metro Vancouver area and a settler scholar who lives and works on the unceded territories of Coast Salish peoples, including the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, Katsia, and Coquitlam First Nations. In this presentation, I'm going to be discussing my recent research into the effectiveness of embodied humanities methodologies in engaging undergraduate students. My focus is on using EH, embodied humanities techniques, to engage students in studying both the new and old media of the 18th century. To encourage students, in other words, to relate more deeply to the literature and culture of the 18th century from the perspective of book history. A book history that involves not just the printed word, but spoken and handwritten genres as well. Research such as that collected in S. Christensen, A. L. Reshi, and C. Wiley's Handbook of Research on Student Engagement suggests that there is a clear connection between engagement and educational outcomes. So, in tandem with boosting student engagement, my aim is also to positively impact educational outcomes. In addition, as I'll be discussing, embodied humanities pedagogies also contribute to student and instructor wellness. There are four parts to this talk. First, I want to provide a brief theoretical background on embodied humanities. Second, I'd like to share with you a case study of a third year English course which I created in 2019, and I'll be telling you about the content and the data that I collected from that. I'd like to briefly indicate then how I shifted the structure of this class to remote environment in 2020 for a graduate and an undergraduate class. And I'll conclude by discussing how the experiences of teaching using EH techniques engage students in book history. So let me start then with a theoretical background. For concepts on embodied learning, I owed a huge debt to Andrew Griffin and the faculty and students at UC Santa Barbara. This was really the inspiration for my current researches. In an article entitled Why Making? The Making of a Broadside Ballad, Griffin explores the process whereby he and fellow colleagues, both faculty members and graduate students, sought to make a broadside ballad, including everything from making the paper to performing the ballad in order to find out more about 18th century culture. As Griffin writes, instead of deriving knowledge from textual sources, participants turned instead to our senses and put our bodies through the labors that other long dead bodies have previously performed. This process of enactment, he argues, can result in a new kind of critical engagement and a new kind of knowledge. We know now, for instance, suggests Griffin, how the art we engage in is limited by the material affordances of the stuff and technology used in its production. For Griffin and his fellow makers, this new knowledge that results when an experience is treated as an admissible form of evidence expands beyond historicism to engage broadside ballads differently. It also suggests, he suggests, works to broaden students' understanding of the purpose of humanities studies, showing them how humanities connect with technology and material culture, both historically and in the present day. Griffin uses the term experimental humanities to refer to his techniques. While this serves to connect his methodologies to form of what is forms of what is known as experiment, experimental learning, the term also contains resonances of the closely named experimental method. Although there are similarities between what Griffin calls experimental humanities and the experimental method that is the standard practice in science-based research, the latter involves specific protocols regarding the use of single variables and reproducibility. I use the term embodied humanities instead in order to avoid any poten potential problems raised by the use of the word experimental. 
My sense of embodiment, the term embodiment, relies on two different senses of embodiment, which also connects my research to two different theoretical fields. On the one hand, I'm referring to using our bodies in the classroom through singing, for example. This connects my research to performance studies. On the other hand, I use embodiment in terms of making students aware of the historical materiality of media, for example, paper and ink. This aspect of embodiment relates to the new materialism. And I discuss these further on my website, uh, which you can find at, at www.sfu.ca slash people slash leith slash research slash embodied humanities html. All right, that's the brief introduction to the theoretical perspectives of this project. I'd like to move on to discuss a particular case study, English 320. This was a new course that I developed with a grant from Simon Fraser University's Institute for Teaching and Learning in the Disciplines, a third year course centered on mediation and media change in the 18th century. The idea was to invite students to think about connections between the media changes we're currently experiencing from print to digitally based communications and the media changes of the late 17th and early 18th centuries, a change from oral and manuscript culture to a marketplace of print culture. In an effort to implement this new technology, I incorporated three labs into the course to introduce students in an embodied manner to the three kinds of 18th century media that we were studying, oral, manuscript, and print. I invited two ballad singers to come into the classroom and the ballad singers came in and shared their singing. They also involved and engaged students in the act of singing and students subsequently reflected on this process. For the lab on manuscript culture, I employed a two-part lab. To begin with, the students and I learned how to make and write with quill pens. And we also experienced a workshop with Heather Wolf, curator of manuscripts at the Folger Library on understanding early modern letters. For the print culture lab, I was able to take students in to use the letterpress at, at the SFU library's makerspace. And they experienced firsthand what it was like to compose type and also to turn the wheel in order to produce a printed work. The primary materials for the course were organized around these three labs, but I made sure to emphasize the intermediality of the materials. So ballads could be sung, they could be written down, they could be sung again, printed, and then sung. Um, there is an intermedial process involved. In terms of the primary materials for oral culture, we used materials from the English Broadside Ballad Archive, as well as a collection of old ballads. We also looked at the ballads within Ellen Ramsey's The Gentle Shepherd and John Gay's The Beggar's Opera. For manuscript culture primary materials, we engaged with letter writing manuals such as John Hill's Young Secretary's Guide. We also looked at commonplace books, manuscript newsletters, and 18th century recipe books. Studying Sammy Richards' Pamela took us to look at printed letters. And we also considered printed letters in Lady Mary Wortley Montague's Persian Letters and Alexander Pope's Epistle to Arbuthnot. For print culture primary materials, we looked at the development of early newspapers in the context of 18th century and 17th century coffee houses. 
And we also considered the rise of periodical culture at the late 18th, 17th century and early 18th century. We finished up our course with a pop-up coffee house in which we invited students, friends, and other faculty members to join us for singing and drinking coffee um, and, and various kinds of entertainment. And this was an idea that I uh, got from Aaron Keating of the University of Manitoba, a pop-up coffee house. Okay, in terms of data collection, what data did I collect around this course? Well, I worked with an RA, a research assistant, and we had four different kinds of data that we collected. First, we had pre-unit questionnaires, and we asked students their knowledge of, experienced with, and attitudes toward singing, as well as their knowledge of, experiences with, and attitudes toward cursive handwriting to find out where they were starting from. The course included nine portfolio assignments, brief, informal assignments, and it asked, they asked students to answer questions such as, how did doing the manuscript lab impact how you understood Lady Mary Wortley Montague's Turkish Embassy letters? There were also exit questionnaires and feedback after each module, so we could see exactly what students got out of the, mod the, the lab and the module and what we might want to do to improve the course in future. And a fourth unanticipated form of data came in the form of the final assignments. The students were asked to put together their portfolio writings into a format, a remediated format. And for this assignment, I had a wonderful array of possibilities and um, Students experimented with maps, with newspapers, with stories, and as you can see with a chest of small letters carefully sealed in wax. The results, in short, were amazing. And for me, as an instructor who's been working at Simon Fraser for many decades, this was a real kind of um, eureka moment. So in terms of student engagement, Birch et al. identify four indicators of student engagement. And in terms of conclusions, I want to just look at how this course, um, how, how the, the, the indicators stack up for this course. In terms of emotional engagement, in their final reflections on the course, students employed a number of expressions indicating their emotional engagement with the course. They loved it, they enjoyed it, they found it fascinating, as well as thinking, finding it interesting. Um, so there was clearly an emotional connection that students had with the material. In terms of their physical engagement, the second of the indicators, participation was amazing, attendance was extremely high even towards the end of the course, and students said things like um, doing labs and things like this actually motivate me to keep attending class. In terms of cognitive engagement in class, the average for the class was B+. Usually the average for English 320 is B, B-, minus, perhaps. Um, in particular, I have to say there were five of the final portfolio assignments that received marks of A+, and typically I might award one A+, for an assignment in every fifth class or so at the third year level, so I don't hand them out easily. In terms of the cognitive engagement out of class too, this was quite remarkable. Um, of all the classes I've taught in three decades now at SFU, this one was, what was the course that resulted in the most extracurricular student engagement. Students contacted me out of class about ideas they had, how to make paper, letter folding, etc., etc. They shared with me contemporary connections about the material. For instance, connections between ballads and country music. Students indicated they shared their experience with the class with family and peers. As one student said, I talked about it to my friends outside of class and outside of English as well, including to my friends in China. Another student said, 
I wrote a handwritten letter to my sister who lives overseas, which was really awesome. Still another commented, it became a talking point among my friends that I was in the English class where we get to mess around with quills and full letters. It was often referred to in a somewhat jokey tone, but I think you need to be in the class to really understand it. Overall, I love this class. So for me, important here, students demonstrated deep understanding of this material in their weekly portfolio assignments. The integrative part of the portfolio assignments at the end, putting things together and thinking and reflecting on what we had done, really enabled them to dig deeply into the methodologies and to think about the impact. And it was really important to share that methodology with them. I told my students this was an experiment. I shared with them Andrew Griffin's article, and as a result, they were better to, able to articulate and explain their own experiences. As I said, it was a eureka moment for me. And I also was ready to try again with two more classes in fall 2020, uh, English 420 and 820. Unfortunately, we were hit by a pandemic, but with a new ways of teaching grant, I was able to pivot to a remote environment and I examined how these embodied humanities techniques could be transferred and what embodied humanities methodologies in a remote environment might do to enhance student engagement. I also included additional workshops that students did at home. So they did all the workshops at home with me leading them through the workshops including cooking from 18th century manuscript recipe books. Students shared in Canvas discussions what they had created, and this developed a wonderful rapport between the students. So conclusions, using embodied humanities, even pivoting to a remote environment, engages students in substantial ways. It allows them to think and reflect deeply on their learning process. It also allows them to connect with each other and to forge the kinds of bonds they wouldn't necessarily in a course if they weren't struggling through making paper and getting messy together. I should conclude also by saying that this is an ongoing project and I welcome you if you are interested in finding out more about the project or in being involved in it, if you use embodied technologies for pedagogy, or if you're interested in doing that, please do contact me at leith at sfu.ca.